Okay, let's start this video with this beautiful simulation known as Starforge. This simulation is supposed to show us how various stars form from a molecular cloud. Or in other words, it shows us the formation of a star nursery and the formation of various types of stars, including stars similar to our Sun. And based on a lot of similar simulations, today researchers worked out how most of the stars in the universe seem to form. But there are some inconsistencies. Specifically when it comes to anomalous stars, such as stars that are just way too massive. And so for example here, even though you're observing the formation of different types of stars already, the majority of them are going to end up being much much smaller than approximately 20 solar masses in mass. And that's because based on different models and different simulations, today we know that as stars form, there are usually a lot of different phenomena that prevent them from growing too large. Yet then we get stars like this. This is a star located in the Tarantula Nebula, referred to as Bat 99-98. A star with a mass of 226 solar masses and is essentially the most massive known star as of 2025. And so exactly how such massive stars form has always been a bit of a mystery, because not a single model we have right now seems to be able to recreate any of this and explain how this is possible. And the thing is that famous formation known as the Tarantula Nebula contains a lot of these really massive stars, many of them over 100 solar masses in mass, and many of them tremendously powerful. And of course, something similar exists much closer to us, including the star we've discussed previously in one of the videos in the description, referred to as Eta Carina. And so how exactly is this possible? Because according to these modern simulations, as a typical star grows to about 30 solar masses, it starts to create so much outward radiation that all of the gas around it should be completely pushed away and it should have no ability to grow any further. Likewise, other mechanisms, such as for example the super powerful stellar jets you see right here, or the tidal fragmentation of the disk, are supposed to also prevent the growth of the star, only forming stars within about 30 solar masses in mass. And it's actually the fragmentation of the disk that eventually starts to form various planets. So in other words, star formation is a very inefficient process. Yet we know that massive stars exist and so somehow they're able to grow much, much larger. And it wasn't until recently, and until the most accurate observations using the Very Large Array, a series of radio telescopes that basically create some of the highest resolution images available to us, that researchers finally figured out how at least one of these stars seems to form, with the discovery in this case very likely applying to most of them. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's discuss a relatively recent study by Sana, Oliva, Moscadelli, and the team you see right here, that as always you can find in the description, that potentially solves the mystery of these massive stars by observing one of them in an extremely precise way. And in this case, focusing on the constellation known as Cepheus A, a star forming region approximately 2300 light years away from us, known to contain several stars that seem to be forming super fast and that currently have a chance of becoming super massive. But the problem with observing these stars and observing these molecular clouds is really the fact that they're usually covered by a huge amount of dust. As a matter of fact, the more massive the star, the more dust it has around it, and the more difficult it becomes to try to understand what's going on inside. And so normally we actually observe these really massive stars after they already formed, but the actual process of forming these stars has not been explored until relatively recently. And so here, by using the radio observations from the Very Large Array, researchers focused on one of these objects referred to as HW2, a star that has been studied previously quite a few times simply because it seems to contain enormous jets. As a matter of fact, in a lot of previous observations, it was definitively established to contain extremely powerful emissions, but that also seems to be hidden by a super thick cloud of dust. Here's roughly what the actual picture looks like. And so because the jets were so massive, here the assumption was that this was most likely an extremely massive star being formed in real time. And this was also confirmed to be a pretty young star as well. And it was also one of the closest such objects to us. So naturally, if we want to understand how massive stars form, we would have to study this object first. But like I mentioned before, it's just a little bit challenging because there's gas everywhere. As a matter of fact, this whole nebula contains an enormous reservoir of gas that's blocking the entire view. And that's of course something that's expected from a region that should be forming these massive stars 
because how else would they get so massive? But in order to actually see inside of it, researchers focused on something else entirely. They focused on observations of ammonia. And that's because ammonia is pretty common in various interstellar clouds. But also, unlike hydrogen and other gases, under certain conditions ammonia is extremely easily visible. It actually produces very specific spectral lines, which tend to change if the conditions are hot or if the conditions contain extremely dense environments. As a matter of fact, even to become visible, ammonia actually has to become pretty dense, making ammonia an almost perfect gas for studying dense molecular regions. And so naturally here, this is exactly what they discovered. Extremely strong spectral lines of ammonia that indicated a lot of very specific motion, and specifically motion toward the star. And here ammonia created two very specific regions, or specific peaks and observations, that basically suggested blue shift and red shift. Or just to rephrase this, ammonia moving away from us, and ammonia moving toward us, as if it was spinning. But, much more surprisingly, it was also indicating an infalling gas, because here emissions were becoming brighter and brighter the closer to star they got. And so here researchers discovered various transitions of ammonia that were pretty easily visible in radio light, and mostly in the region between 200 to 700 astronomical units, which actually indicated an accretion disk, something that we usually expect from things like black holes, and something that around black holes is responsible for their feeding as well. And though accretion disks are pretty common around most stars, usually they break apart pretty fast and turn into protoplanetary disks that eventually start forming planets. But not in this case. In this case, because this disk is so massive and seems to feed the star so fast, it just does not have enough time to break apart or to be disrupted in any other way, and instead seems to produce an extremely effective gas inflow that makes the star grow by about two thousandths of the solar mass every single year. Or just to rephrase this, in the next thousand years, this star is going to be at least two solar masses larger. And that's one of the highest rates observed around any star. And so here this confirmation for the existence of this accretion disk technically confirms several different predictions and previous assumptions about how these stars seem to form. This was actually predicted in some of the previous studies, but never really proven officially, with this study providing the first direct evidence for a disk-guided accretion that seems to encourage growth of stars to tens or even hundreds solar masses. Although here this seems to be not the only such process. As a matter of fact, additional observations also revealed additional structures that seem to be feeding this disk. And specifically, a structure that's been previously seen in a lot of other molecular clouds referred to as a streamer. And these unusual streams of gas are also responsible for adding even more mass into the already massive accretion disk. In this case, there was direct evidence that one side of the disk was much more massive than the other with these streamers very likely playing a major role in allowing massive stars to become even more massive. And based on what we know about these streamers and based on previous observations, they don't actually seem to be stars or even connected to stars, but instead unusual dense filaments produced through various interactions inside the cloud, usually as a result of various overdensities as a lot of these gas clouds start to collide. And in most of these clouds, these streamers do actually deliver a lot of gas either into the star or sometimes away from the cloud itself. They also seem to be connected to various magnetic fields, so here the exact interactions are very complex. But looks like in some cases, when these streamers connect to the accretion disk, they allow the star to grow even larger, making the accretion disk even more effective, and making the star grow even faster. Which is exactly what's observed in this particular case, and exactly what researchers discovered in this extremely massive system. And as you can see, everything here is really large. The disk itself is hundreds of AU in radius and seems to be actively feeding the star in the center. Which I guess once and for all confirms that, in order to create these massive stars, you basically just need an extremely effective accretion disk. And though in most cases these accretion disks fall apart pretty quick, in some extreme cases they can and do become very effective at making the star grow larger and larger. And so this particular star, HW2, is most likely going to become one of these overmassive stars, possibly tens or maybe even hundreds of solar masses in mass, not so different from other stars like the ones in Eta Carina. And all this finally confirmed with actual evidence using radio telescopes. And actually for science, this was one of the bigger achievements, because here researchers finally used radio interferometry, or essentially using multiple radio telescopes 
to look at something super far away in order to discover processes that would be otherwise entirely hidden from us because of all of the gas and dust in the center. And that means that this technique can now be applied to other objects in order to explain other phenomena. But until these future observations, or until more evidence or something else about massive stars, that's all I wanted to mention. Check out some of the previous videos in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.